Well, I don't know how many of you were here last year. I talked about atypical Cushing disease. We're going to talk about the typical form of it today. And, uh, uh, and I'm going to try to focus on some new things and, of course, some old things and what we've been learning, especially with therapy, uh, with trilostane. Um, and I'm going to give you an update and trying to move from confusion to clarity if we can. However, right out of the starting gate, I think it's time to play stomp the audience. And so what's that about? Well, by the way, stomp the audience, you're probably wondering, what in the world is this elephant doing right over what is really a veterinarian? I have a, uh, a good friend of mine who's a Russian artist, and uh, she's very, very good at what she does. But there's a little, sometimes she doesn't understand me and I don't understand her. I told her to make a slide of an audience being stopped. And instead, <laughs> Stop. it's being stopped. Okay. Although, okay, I guess you're stopped that there's stopping going on. But nevertheless, that's what this is all about here. <laughs> so, um, stop in the audience, meaning we have three dogs here. And which one of these dogs, uh, in your opinion, has Cushing disease? Oh. Is it this dog? Okay. <laughs> this dog? Or this dog? Or is it all three dogs? Well, the reality is there's only two dogs that have Cushing's out of the three, even though they all kind of have the same phenotype. They all kind of look like they have Cushing's. Oh, this, although this dog is a pretty tucked up abdomen, but that doesn't roll it out. So the question is, how are you going to make a decision which one of the two out of the three actually has cushions? Well, one can argue that the best test is a physical exam and a history. And when you're going to be thinking about applying screening tests, such as a low-dose tech suppression or an ACCH response or the urine test, you want to apply it to animals where it's highly likely they have the disorder. If you start applying it to animals where it's not so likely, Let's say they don't have any clinical sign and all this wrong with them, there's a little bit of air loss. You're going to end up diagnosing more dogs with Cushing disease than actually have the disorder. And that's very, very common in our profession. So what are the ingredients of a good screening test? I ask that to get this started here. Well, in my mind, uh, the ingredients are you, you take a very, very good steak and you chop it up. And you put those pieces into this dog food bowl. But well, we're not finished. Now we're going to get this really greasy elbow prime cut. And we're going to add that to the steak. And so we now we have a dog food bowl with steak and this greasy elbow. We're not finished yet either. We're going to grab a can of gasoline that's full. And we're going to pour it around that dog food bowl. And then we're going to light it with a match. So what do we have? We have this ring of fire. So I guarantee you, a dog with Cushing disease will leave you <laughs> the ring of fire to get a food. Okay. And so if you choose your cases carefully, let's put it this way, if the dog doesn't have Cushing disease, you're not going to do this. So if you ever run out of dexamethasone, you know exactly <laughs> what to do to come to the conclusion whether an animal has this disorder. So let's take a look at Blackie, who's an eight-year-old female spade mixed breed. And um, was seen by a neurologist. And Blackie um, had weakness in all legs and mild ataxia. And there was no PUPD. And uh, if we take a look at the specific gravity, uh, it's 1040, and that would suggest that there, this dog is not drinking a lot. Uh, the dog had normal mentation and normal appetite. And because it did see a neurologist, you know what they do. Uh, MRI, and I'm surprised it wasn't a CT in addition, but we had at least one of them, and a chest x-ray. And they thought to themselves, well, you know, maybe this is some kind of perineoplastic syndrome that's causing this four-legged weakness issue. So what they chose to do is an abdominal ultrasound. So an ultrasound, they noticed that there were two adrenals that were mildly enlarged. So uh, technically, this dog had bilateral adrenal megalith. So now they said, ah, OK, it must have Cushing's disease. So they did a low-dose depth suppression. And this was done at Antec. And uh, at Antec, if you have uh, cortisols at eight hours, they're below 1.4 micrograms per deciliter. That's considered a normal test. And this is below one. So this, suggests, this is a test that's not consistent with Cushing's. 
not even sure that there's anything about this case that suggests that other main variables are large. But nevertheless, it's one of those that's negative. So then they said, well, it must be atypical for shin disease. So then they did this profile at the University of Tennessee. The cortisols came back normal following ACTH. The androstein Dion level, a little asterisk there, was elevated. The high end is 3.97, it was 5.3. The progesterone was normal, very high normal, but normal. And the hydroxy progesterone was minorly elevated um, at two, two and a half. Because the sex steroids were elevated, they said, you know what? This is, must be atypical Cushing's disease, so we're going to treat this dog with lysogen therapy. And they nearly killed it up. So my question to you is, do you think this dog has Cushing's? Is there anything about this case, from a clinical point of view, that suggests it has Cushing's disease? Or any side of the room in here? I think that probably means no. So there is nothing about this case. Kid Cushing's, you want to think of it as a clinical syndrome. So they got thrown off by the fact that this animal had bilateral adrenal megaly. I want to tell you right now, Marla spent time at the Animal Medical Center, and so did I. And during those days, it was very, very busy and very, very stressful. And at the end of the day, we used to kid with each other saying, you know, I wonder how big our adrenals got to. <laughs> <laughs> so bilateral adrenal megaly, if you see that, by no means is that pathognomonic for fishing. It has nothing to do with any clinical syndrome. It just means there's something going on that's stressful for a long period of time, and these adrenals are going to grow. So this is the owner of that period of time. This is what you're trying to avoid. You don't want owners like this. Instead, you want owners like this. So the whole idea is if you're going to be applying screen tests, which I'm going to talk about, you want to apply it to animals, again, it's very likely from a clinical point of view that they have the disorder. Okay, so how am I going to classify Cushing disease? I think you're all aware of this, and the vast majority of cases are pituitary dependent. These are classical cases. That's all due to a, a small tumor, usually in the pituitary. That's actually a section uh, through the pituitary gland. This is the uh, pars distalis. This is the pars intermedia there. And that's the pars nervosa, not that you would know that. And uh, by looking at that slide anyway. And then we have the so-called <coughs> atypical Cushing's. That's really, most of them are really classical Cushing disease. Um, but the true atypicals are dogs that you do the low-dose tech suppression test or the, or the ACTH response and they're absolutely normal, but they have signs and symptoms consistent with the disorder. And if you look at sex steroids, you find they're elevated, so you come to the conclusion that's what's wrong with these dogs. And then we have what's called ectopic Cushing's. These are very, very rare. These are tumors, for example, in the lungs that are producing ACTH. And those will cause the adrenals to enlarge. And the only way you're going to fix those dogs is either A, uh, diagnosis as a lung tumor, and then you remove it, and then they get better. Or else you could treat them with lysogen therapy. You're not fixing the lung tumor, but you're getting rid of the, the idea that the lung tumor is causing those adrenals to get bigger. And then we have what's called the ACTH independent group. Those are the dogs with adrenal tumors. Mostly have cortisol. We have occasional adrenal tumors that all they produce are sex steroids. And then we have what's called food dependent Cushing's. Those are dogs that the more they eat and uh, the more often they eat, it actually triggers cortisol release from their adrenals, believe it or not. And they develop Cushing disease. And then we have pseudo Cushing's. Those are our dogs. Like that, by the way, that was the Pomeranian that was way over on the right-hand side as you're looking at the screen. That's a dog with what's called the hair cycle rest syndrome. We call it pseudo Cushing's because they have the phenotype, but they don't have any metabolic abnormalities whatsoever, such as PUPD or polyphagia. And then, of course, iatrogenic dogs are not too much for themselves. So what about testing? Let's talk very quickly about the screening tests. There's some things that you may not know. Um, ACTH response test, I think we're all aware of this test, it's very, very popular. But I'll bet most of you don't know, they don't use this test at all in human medicine to diagnose Cushing's. Why? Because it's not a very good test. Um, the sensitivity of this test is very, very poor in human medicine, and actually in veterinary medicine it's pretty poor too. You're going to miss, with your PDH dogs, about 20 to 30 percent. In other words, you're going to do a stimulation test and it's not going to be exaggerated. 
but it still remains a popular test because it's easy to do. With adrenal tumors, you're going to miss, we've done this for years, you're going to miss up to 50% of adrenal tumors using an ACTH response test. By no means does, it, does that imply you shouldn't use the test, but you need to know its limitations. You know, the Clint Eastwood phrase, a man must know his limitations, and you need to know the limitations of these tests. Now, there's a, Sandoz has a generic form of corticin that's available. That's our gold standard corticin. I guess you all realize that. We're all using around five micrograms per kilo, you know, either an IV or IM. And there is a generic form. Um, what we don't know about the generic form is if once we open that bottle or stick a needle in it, can we put it in a refrigerator, and how long will it be efficacious when we do that? No one's done the experiment, so we don't know. So it's kind of like a one-use type thing. Um, the other thing, we, as you're all aware, there's a lot of gels out there now. These are compounded gels. Some of the gels like efficacy, in other words, they don't work. So what you're looking at are really two resting cortisols if you're doing a, an ACTH response looking at a zero and a two-hour test. Some gels peak early and some peak late. Meaning if you give a gel, uh, you might have the, a high cortisol in one hour and one that's significantly lower in two hours and vice versa. And the only way you're going to be able to sort that out is if you do have a gel in your clinic and you're going to continue to use it, then you should do a stimulation test on one of your, um, either somebody's dog, like their own pet, for example, or maybe the blood donor and determine, that at least with that lot number of that gel, do they peak early, at like at one hour, and fall off at two hours, or do they peak uh, at two hours, and they, they don't have a peak at one hour? You don't know until you do the test. So what about the low-dose dose suppression? This is considered our consensus choice, um, although not all dogs should get a low dose, but probably the majority especially dogs that aren't stressed out that they're put in the clinic, you know, for an eight-hour period. Um, the thing to remember, it's still not a perfect test. You're going to miss probably at least 5% of the dogs. In other words, you're going to have a dog that has classic signs of Cushing's, and about 5% of the time, uh, that dog is going to have a normal low dose. So you have to remember that there are just some dogs out there that are very difficult to diagnose. I asked Mark Peterson, who was my mentor when I was at the Animal Medical Center, I had a dog that had classic signs of Cushing's, and I did a low dose and it was normal. And I went up to him just, and I wanted him to pity me, saying, well, this is normal, I don't understand it. And he just smiled and said, well, he said, sometimes one test is better than the other one, meaning the ACTH response in that particular case may be a better choice than the low dose. Of course, you don't know that until you do the test. Um, with the low dose, there's a new pattern that none of us were taught, unless you're at Zurich University, and that's referred to as the inverse test result. Some dogs, and this was a study that was done and published in Vet Record you know, back in the middle of the 2000s um, from the University of Zurich. Uh, some dogs with hyperadrenal corticism uh, have the four hour cortisol that's above the cutoff, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a picture in a minute and uh, the eight-hour cortisol below the cutoff. And what they found is, in a huge study, not a huge, but in a study of 80 dogs, all of which absolutely had Cushing's disease, 10 of these 80 dogs had a normal low-dose dexpression test. And five of the dogs had this inverse pattern, which I'm gonna show you. And so their conclusion was that this inverse pattern, if you see it, uh, it's suggestive of Cushing's, but just because you have a test that suggests it doesn't necessarily mean you have it. They're not passing the mind. Of course, you have to look at the clinical picture. So lack of awareness of this particular pattern may lead to underdiagnosis of classical Cushing disease. So what in the world is the inverse pattern? We've all been taught that the key to understanding or assessing a low dose is to look at that eight-hour cortisol. And if that eight-hour cortisol, again, we're taught, is below the cutoff, whatever that normal cutoff is at the laboratory. At Antec, it's 1.4. Uh, at Michigan State, it's 1. At Cornell, it's 0.5, believe it or not. And at Davis, it's 0.6. The point is, we're taught if it's below the cutoff, that means the dog doesn't have underlying Cushing disease or hyperadrenal cortisol. 
Well, what they're suggesting is, based on their studies at Zurich, so let's take a look at the inverse pattern. So we have a, the initial cortisol is above the cutoff, and the four hour, which is the intermediate cortisol, is still above the, cort, uh, above the cutoff, but the eight hour is below it. So if you have the four hour and the zero hour above it, and we have it drop below it at eight hours, this is the inverse pattern suggesting that you actually have underlying hyperadrenal corticism, assuming, of course, that dog is clinical for the disorder. How often does it happen? Maybe 5 to 10% of the time. So maybe at the most 10%. Maybe 1 out of 10 low doses are going to be like this. And you've probably all seen this, but you didn't recognize the pattern. And now that I've shown it to you, next time you do a low dose, you might pick up on it. This is the typical escape pattern that we see. Here's a dog that, that, um, that the initial cortisol is about to cut off. Then at four hours, it drops below the cutoff, and then we call it escaping, meaning it jumps up well above the cutoff at eight hours. And when we see that type of pattern, uh, that's highly suggestive that we're doing, dealing with pituitary-dependent disease. But the inverse, when you see this, and I should mention that when you see the inverse pattern, it's positive. The type of cushions we're talking about is pituitary-dependent, if you see the inverse. So they look totally different. Um, but this pattern is, uh, we, and we do see it, like I said, 5 to 10% of the time. What about urine testing in dogs with um, Cushing disease? The, um, it's important to realize that this test was originated in Utrecht in the 1980s. They had a proprietary assay. They developed their own assay. They didn't depend on some company uh, that had a kit to measure the amount of cortisol in the urine. And they found that their assay was very, when they apply it to dogs with Cushing's, it was very sensitive and specific. In other words, if it was positive, it was very likely they had the disorder. And, uh, and then they went on to confirm that in the vast majority of cases. The problem with the assays that we use in the United States, we get a lot of false positive results. There's other steroids that are produced by the adrenal that cross-react with these assays that are done in the United States, whether it's done at ANTAC, whether it's done at Michigan State University, whether it's done at Auburn or IDAC, it doesn't matter. You get a lot of false positive testing. So when you do the urine test here, and it's positive, it's consistent with the disorder, but absolutely not diagnostic. And if it's negative, uh, meaning it's below the cutoff, it's highly unlikely that you're actually dealing with hyperadrenal cortisism. So the take-home message is, uh, if it is positive, it's consistent, but not diagnostic, and if it's normal, it's really a better test to rule out the disease, really, when it comes down to it, at least with the assays here in this country. Uh, and this is just showing that um, these are three dogs that were worked up over in Zurich. What they do is they have the clients collect uh, urines on three successive days, and they send it into Utrecht, and then Utrecht determines a cortisol cracking ratio. And then they kind of look at an average, you know, over time. And this dog, you can see that you got the urine, uh, uh, cortisol cracking ratios, they bounce around considerably. But with this particular dog, it's all above the cutoff. So no matter when you pull the urine, it's consistent with the disorder. But look at this dog. It's bouncing all over the place. On some days, it's below the cutoff. Other days, it's above it. And, uh, and if you pulled it anywhere in this area, you would have had a negative urine cortisol cracking ratio. Uh, what you end up having to do with dogs like this is that you just wait. It's a progressive disease, and eventually it's going to surface its ugly head. And eventually, it, this, the red pattern, if you will, all these red dots and lines are going to look like this dog here. And then here's a dog that had very, very mild Cushing's the vast majority of time when you looked at the UCCR, it was actually negative. So why do this test? Well, you know why to do this test. <laughs> Let's say this dog was going to come in your clinic for a low-dose depth suppression. Would you be welcoming this dog with open arms? It's going to be in your clinic that you're going to have to draw three blood yes, samples over an eight-hour period and subject your employees to this dog or this cat. And so this is a very, very useful test, especially in some of the patients. 
So what are the treatment considerations? Well, in some cases, we don't do anything. Sometimes the best thing to do is nothing. And um, I remember at the Animal Medical Center, all the interns, they had to do something with the cases. If there was a if the case was brought in, they had to fiddle with it and do this to it and stick needles in it. What was interesting, they had all these cats, these clock cats. This is in the old days when they, we saw that dilated cardiomyopathy and they would throw clots to, to their um, AORE bifurcation. And they did a study, they compared how the survival rate of those cats at the University of Pennsylvania, where they have a great um, uh, the, uh, emergency type group, critical care group, but they were doing stuff to these animals all the time. And the AMC, what we did, maybe we were just stupid. We just put them in a cage and put a lamp on them, keep them warm, and left them alone. And guess what? The survival rates were much better at the Animal Medical Center than at the University of Pennsylvania because they always had a fool, just like our interns. So no treatment sometimes works. Um, Mitotane, trilostane and ketoconazole or other um, ways to treat melatonin malignans, aldeprinil, surgery and radiation therapy. There are all sorts of ways we can treat a dog with Cushing disease. So we can either target the surgery or we can target the adrenal gland. Now in people, this is a young girl with Cushing disease, the vast majority of time, they're gonna target the pituitary with surgery. That's the standard of care in human medicine. And they've got a lot of really great surgeons that can do an excellent job. So the um, uh, efficacy is between 80 and 90%, and um, uh, the vast and the vast majority, of, there's very few deaths through this type of procedure, unless, it's, unless these tumors are really, really big. But nevertheless, that's the treatment of choice. Now, there's only one person that I'm aware of in this country that does hypothesectomies. And she is at Washington State University. She used to be at West LA. And she does this very successfully. And but that's one person in the country. So we don't have a number, a large number of people that do this procedure. And, um, and then radiation therapy, that's certainly done. We have now newer ways of doing it, stereotactic type radiation therapy. The problem is with Cushing's, if they're showing neurologic signs because of that pituitary tumor, uh, and you treat that with radiation therapy, you can fix that problem. That the tumors will get smaller in many cases, and the neurologic signs will, will lessen or disappear. The problem is, what about the signs of Cushing's disease like PUPD and polyphagia? That's all due to too much ACTH being produced by that tumor. And interestingly, with radiation therapy, no matter what type you use, you only get resolution in clinical signs maybe 25% of the time, even with the cyber knife, which is a form of stereotactic radiation therapy. And that can take up to six months. And so uh, it doesn't work as well. And it's very, very expensive. In New York, we're charging weed. I'm not doing that. Uh, there's a group that does it. They're charging a better part of $10,000. Um, but if the dog is showing neurologic signs, it's very useful. But the resolution of the clinical signs, like I mentioned, is only one out of four cases. So therefore, because of the cost and the availability, uh, for example, the surgery, and the cost of radiation therapy, uh, we have targeted the adrenal gland with various drugs. So let's step into a time machine. It's time to do that. And this is the machine right here, and that's me. <laughs> and we're going to go back. We're going to go back to 1973. This is when the veterinary profession in this country uh, decided to go to war with the plump of dream. <laughs> So what is this paper all about? This is, this is Ron Schechter, he was in Davis, California. He was the very first person to publish uh, the use of lysogen therapy, OPDDD, for the treatment of Cushing's disease. And it just revolutionized how we treat it. So guess how it was treated before this time, before we had a drug that could manipulate the dream. It was treated with bilateral hypothesectin. And if the owners elected not to do that, then it was bathing them because they would have dermatolo you know, dermatologic issues, antibiotics for the UTIs, and so forth. That's how we treat Christian disease in all this. So 
uh, this drug really was a lifesaver. Um, you're probably wondering what Godzilla is doing up here. Uh, basically, it's just to remind everybody that um, this, this drug causes indiscriminate destruction, just like Godzilla. Uh, years ago, I was invited to Japan, and uh, it's a long trip over there. It's almost a day. And I had a lecture after I got there the next day. So I was really jet lagged. And uh, I was at the point of a lecture where I was trying to describe what Lysergen did to the adrenal cortex. So I was having a very hard time, even though I had an interpreter trying to describe the interpreter. They didn't even understand what I was trying to say. And so then I thought to myself, and I said, well, I'm going to be a little creative here. And I, and I told the interpreter to tell the audience that Lysergen was like letting loose little miniature Godzillas into the adrenal cortex. And then everybody said, oh, I get it. They understood. <laughs> so several years later, I, I came back, or I was invited back to Japan, different area. But evidently, there was one person, at least in that audience, that had been at my previous talk several years before. And so I got to the point of the lecture where I was going to talk about Lysogen. Trial hadn't hit the, you know, hadn't hit the market yet. And so I was going to describe what it did. And just as I was about to get to that point in my lecture, this Japanese person who was in the very back did something very uncharacteristic of the Japanese and screamed out very loud, Godzilla! <laughs> <laughs> so medical therapy, what's out there? Well, you have Godzilla. Lines are all, you know, that it works a lot like Travis Stan. Um, Ed Feldman, and actually Dave Rouette, who used to was his resident, this is way back when, at Davis. And it was Dave's project, along with Ed Feldman. And uh, they looked at the use of ketoconazole. And at the time, there was no generic. So it was very, very expensive, especially with the dosages we used to use in those days. It was really, really high dosages. And um, the big problem is, is that, um, number one, it wasn't available as a generic, so it was expensive. And these dogs would throw it up, and then, uh, uh, especially with the higher dosages, and then a few dogs would turn bright yellow. And you know what it's like, I don't know what it is about our profession, but if something goes wrong one time, it's like, well, that's it, I'm not using that drug again. And uh, so it never became very popular, uh, but it has become a little more popular in certain areas of the country that treat a lot of fungal disease, that use a lot of ketoconazole, because it's cheap, now that you get it as a generic. But nevertheless, it just hasn't, again, it's just never been, has not become anybody's fate. Let's put it that way. We have melatonin and lignans, and all I'm going to tell you is, I know it doesn't make sense, but this type of therapy actually does work in some dogs. The problem is no one, unless they're going to lie to you, is going to tell you what percentage of dogs where it's going to be effective. And then how long it's going to take? Is it going to take two months, three months, six months? And I just tell people, why don't you go ahead and try it, go for a couple months, and if the dog's not getting any better, and just assume it's not going to be effective. Uh, Ed Feldman's idea, he liked it, uh, giving people, telling people to use this drug, and also Deprinil, um, mainly because as far as he was concerned, these drugs didn't work. And so he figured if he peddled these drugs, that the owners would definitely come back, and they would of course, use another drug. He was a big uh, proponent of using isogen. Um, and then there's drugs you can get through the internet. Um, it's called Adrenal Harmony, Harmony Gold now. It was called Super Gland. And this is one of these things you get through the internet that, that, that there's all these great testimonials of how these animals get better. But you can't document that it lowers cortisols. And they have, in these, they have what's called adaptogen where the animals learn how to adapt to the stress of their disorder. And that's how they get back. So, at any rate, I just want to mention that there are these types of drugs out there. But it's very questionable how effective they are. And then, of course, Trilostain came on the scene. Uh, this was FDA approved in 2008, but before that it was used uh, for quite a while over in Europe. And the reason why it was used in Europe, because they had to jump through a lot of hoops to use lysogen. That was like a really bad drug over there. You couldn't use lysogen if there was if there were children in the house or if a, uh, a woman was pregnant. It was like against the law to bring it, even have it in the house and be just giving it to your dog. And you had to fill out all this paperwork if you were going to use lysogen. 
And uh, so they decided they're going to have to look for a different drug. What's interesting about Lysergen, I'll just tell you real quick, Mark Peterson was actually, um, went to Washington, D.C. and stood in front of the FDA. He wanted to try to get Lysergen approved um, for the treatment of Cushing disease. You know, it's not approved for uh, the treatment of Cushing, but everybody uses it anyway. And, uh, but nevertheless, the FDA looked at all this data on, on he brought in data on over 200 dogs with pituitary dependent disease. And they said, no, we're not going to approve it. And he said, well, why? And the FDA said, because it's too dangerous. That was their quote. Mm -hmm. So uh, this drug, Betarel, was FDA approved in 2008. And you can use it for both PDH and adrenal tumors. A lot of people don't realize you can use it for adrenal tumors, and it works very, very well. Uh, and you know about the availability. And the latest is it's now available in 5 milligram capsules, which is very, very useful for a smaller dog. Uh, and what it does, or one of the things that it does, it interferes with um, uh, these synthetic pathways, uh, enzymatic pathways that are involved in the synthesis of aldosterone, cortisol, and these sex steroids. And it, it basically inhibits this particular enzyme, uh, which is very important on the synthesis of these different steroids that are produced by the adrenal. Now, the other thing that it does, it's important to realize this, the company doesn't like for people to mention this, even though it's true, because it, it makes everybody a little afraid of the drug. Uh, you get certain adrenal changes following the treatment of trivastin. Number one, especially for you budding ultrasonographers, when you put an animal in trivastin, unlike with lysogen, the adrenals get bigger over time. And if you don't know that, and you come along six months to a year later and re-image a dog that you've been treating with trivastin, you're going to be taken back by noticing the adrenals are actually like 25% bigger than they were when you looked at them the first time. And then you start thinking, what in the world's going on here? Is this dog having adrenal tumor? The other thing it does, and probably the vast majority of dogs out there, it causes low-grade adrenal necrosis. So usually very, very slow. These are dogs where their adrenals were removed they died from something else, not from adrenal necrosis. They died from, from another disorder, and their adrenals were biopsied. This, this is this work that was done out of uh, Utrecht, not Utrecht, but uh, out of Zurich. By the way, the Europeans, you know, Ed Feldman and Dick Nelson are retired this year at Davis, and the Europeans are taking uh, endocrinology by storm. It is absolutely unbelievable the type of work they're doing. Uh, nevertheless, this is a, a Zurich study, and you give many credit. And just to show you the inflammation, what happened is you're getting necrosis in this area, scar tissue is getting laid down, and typically it's very, very slow in onset. And I'll show you what happens with these dogs over a long period of time. Uh, but very, very common that this happens. So here is Cherry, 11 year old female Yorkie mix. Um, if you're going to be using lysogen or trivastain, one thing you always want to tell clients or your pet owners is to monitor appetite. And if that dog becomes an appetite, there is a serious problem, or potentially a serious problem. And this dog stopped eating, and but the owner continued to give the trivastain. And these are the adrenals, complete adrenal necrosis. Uh, a lot of times when this happens, it happens maybe one out of 200 cases, very small percentage of cases. Um, uh, but a lot of times when it does happen, it happens just after you've started the drug. I actually had a dog, or it wasn't my case, it was a veterinarian's case, at Thurantec. They started uh, trying to stay at the standard dose, which I'll get into. One day later, the dog developed full-blown Addison's disease after one dose, the three milligrams per kilo dose, I'll get into, that may not mean anything to you. It's a, you know, it wasn't really that high of a dose. One day later, electrolyte abnormalities, cortisols, and in the basement, the dog lived, um, but after one dose. Now that is, again, very, very unusual uh, to get this acute onset of renal necrosis. Most of the time, it's this kind of slow piecemeal type situation. So what's the starting dose of trivastain? Um, 
I'll show you, we've really come down with the starting dose compared to the way it was way back when. Uh, typically, if we're going to give them once a day, we're going to start at two mg per k, give them once a day. And we're going to give them once a day uh, to dogs that have mild to moderate clinical signs. About 80% of the dogs are going to respond to once a day therapy. Now, you can give a BID, and oftentimes we do. And we're going to start with a milligram per kilo of BID. Ed Feldman, by the way, starts even lower. So there's, you know, there's no lowest dose you can use. You can use as low as you want to. Most of us start in the milligram per kilo BID. We prefer that for dogs with very severe clinical signs, and it's recommended for uh, all diabetic dogs. So if you have a diabetic, you definitely want to start on, on BID therapy, and that's going to smooth out those, uh, uh, hopefully, those glucose levels throughout the day. This is just giving you an idea of what's happened with the trilostane dose over the years. Back in 2001, that's back in, over in the European days, they were using anywhere between 3 and 12 milligrams per kilo, these really high dosages. And, um, and then as time went on, uh, you would go to these meetings and they would say, Is there, have you seen any sudden death? They were talking about adrenal necrosis. They said, have you ever been really worried way back when? Even though it didn't happen that common. So they kept lowering the dose and finally now we're at this 1 to 2 milligrams per kilo. 1 milligram per kilo VID, 2 milligrams per kilo SID. Uh, duration of action, it varies. Some dogs, duration of action um, is only 12 hours. And those are dogs that definitely need a BID. And other dogs, it might be up to 16 hours, and those dogs will do fine just on once a day. So that's why you have to give it once or twice a day. And there are some dogs that have a very short duration of action, and Feldman claims that he's seen, where he would give the dog, not the dog, but the, the drug three times a day. I would never give the drug any drug three times a day for the rest of the dog's life. I would say, you know what, it's not working. With BID therapy, about 90% of the dogs um, are going to get better. Efficacy is about 90 plus percent, and with SID, the efficacy is about 80 percent. So how are we going to monitor this drug? Um, the you monitor it totally different than lysogen. The timing is exquisitely important. Um, Typically, according to Decker Pharmaceutical, they want you to uh, start it. They want you to monitor using an ACTH response test and starting the test four to six hours after the morning dose. There are three therapeutic ranges out there, optimal ranges in our profession. That's a little confusing to most veterinarians. You have the Decker range. As far as they're concerned, you can have post ACTH cortisols as high as nine. You have the Mark Peterson range. He would like to have them uh, below seven, seven and a half at post ACTH cortisol. And you got Ed Feldman. He wants them really low. He wants them up down here below five and a half. Uh, we typically don't use resting cortisols to monitor, even though there was a paper that suggested that. And we feel that you can be totally, you can be severely misled by doing that. So the timing is very important. A lot of the Europeans start to test at three to four hours. DACRA suggests four to six. Just choose whatever you like. But make sure with that, especially with that dog, you do it the same every time. If you do it at three to four hours where you're monitoring, and then you come back, let's say, six months later, and do it an ACTH response test and start it at six hours, and so it's a six to eight hour uh, window, uh, that can make a big difference in how you're going to dose that drug. It can make a very big difference. So, so you want to, if, you're, if you have a dog, you're starting at three to four hours, make sure you do that every time. If it's four to six hours, make sure you do that every time. And, uh, and then you're not going to get uh, information that can mislead you. So what is the breaking news? This is like CNN. <laughs> Mini dose corpses, and I'm sure some of you have heard about this. This is a study done in Auburn. Uh, was delivered as an abstract, and you can use as little as one microgram per kilo. Normally we use five micrograms per kilo. You can use as little as one microgram per kilo and stimulate the adrenal cortex maximally at one hour. In people, if they're trying to diagnose asthma disease, there's a low dose that's used to make that diagnosis. In people, they'll use one microgram total, not per kilo, total. What that's telling us is when you're using this product, 
Just these little tiny amounts are stimulating that adrenal gland ultra physiologically. However, if you're going to use the mini dose because you're trying to save money, if you're doing a lot of ACTH response tests, that might be to your advantage to save money. Um, you're going to you have to administer an IV. Uh, with the 5 microgram per kilo dose, you can also give an IM. However, with this dose, you want to give an IV. And uh, the other important thing is, here is the 5 microgram per kilo dose here. Let's say we start here, we go up here at 60 minutes, and the 5 microgram per kilo dose continues to rise up to 90 minutes. So if you're a little bit late, uh, and pick, you know, and doing that ACTH response test, that second cortisol, you do it an hour and 15 minutes, maybe an hour and 30 minutes, it's not going to alter your results in a negative way. However, if you're using the one microgram per kilo dose, look what happens. It peaks out at 60 minutes almost exactly, but then it starts to fall off significantly. So if you're late with this mini dose of cortisone, uh, you're, liable, you're liable to get a uh, a value that's uh, significantly lower uh, than it would have been had you done it in an hour, and you might make the wrong assessment. So just just pointing out, if you're going to use it, you want to be on time. Now, here's some more breaking news. Monitoring without cortisol. How many of you wish that there was another way to monitor? Because you don't like to use cortisol. Because it costs too much. Over in Europe, the reason why they looked into this is because Synactin, which is their brand of cortisol, all of a sudden was impossible to get. And then when it came back on the market, it went up 10, 10 times as far as cost. And so they said, you know what, this is ridiculous. We're going to look at something else. And that's what they did over in Ireland. And so this is a novel cortisol-based method to monitor trinostane therapy in dogs with Cushing's disease. Now, I don't want anybody taking notes. This is, not, this is something that's it's like a pilot study. And right now, Utrecht and Zurich are looking into what I'm going to show you. I'm just going to, I'll try to go through it really quickly, just to show you what is on the horizon. So should we be monitoring and basing our dose adjustments on an ACK simulation test? That's what this is all about. Well, with trilostane, absorption, peak effect, and duration of action varies from dog to dog. So that's, well, that's not so great. OK. And in some dogs, there's a poor relationship between the ACTA simulation results and the clinical response to therapy. They're finding about a third of the time the results of the ACTA's response test are discordant with the clinical picture. That's quite a bit. And so, um, so it's back to always looking at that dog again. You, know, you want to look at those numbers, but you absolutely want to look at the dog. So because of these reasons, they decided to look into this and also that business about uh, their form of portraits and being very expensive. Um, and so what they're doing is with uh, monitoring without ACTA simulation tests. So that the project that they did, they, um, the, the owners bring the dog in and a blood samples pulled. And that's the pre-pill, pre trial stain blood sample. And then what they do is uh, the trial stain is given right there in the clinic. Right? They brought the dog into you and you pull a blood sample, then you give the dog the trial stain. And then you pull a post-pill sample three hours later. So that's what you're going to do with this pre- and post-pill testing. You're not doing anything with cortisone. Now what they did for this study, after they did the pre- and the post-pill, then they injected cortisone at that three-hour mark. And then one hour later, they pulled a post-ACTH sample. And so they could compare that post-ACTH uh, with these other two cortisols. So I'll show you what they did overall. So with all the new cases, they developed a questionnaire, and I was going to show you the example of some of these questions that were asked. So there was a general question about exercise. How active is your dog? Lays in one place near and all the time. Goes for walks, plays on occasions. Very active, happy to run off leave, but gets tired. I cannot tire my dog out. So the owners would check you know, which one would apply to their dog that had cushions. So here's a general, um, and this is like a general question. How does your dog enjoy life? Miserable most of the time. Has more bad days than good days. Happy most of the time, occasionally bad days. Happy all the time. And this was what was done initially with every animal that was entered in the study. And there were several questions 
more than these are just two. I'm just giving you some examples. Then they had the owner um, have a questionnaire daily log that they had to fill out, where they assessed what's called a clinical control. And that was assessed by looking at polyphagia, polyuria, polydipsia, and all these different variables. And they actually had scores that they would give uh, to these animals. And here's the owner questionnaire. This is start and stay monitoring the date, the appetite, thirst, activity, any comments. And of course, there were lots of other um, uh, areas of interest they looked at. I'm just giving you an idea what they did. Um, and they found that this daily log was cheap and surprisingly effective way to monitor. Uh, water consumption closely was linked to cortisol concentrations, makes the owner responsible. And in this study, they photographed the dogs every month to monitor coat and body composition, for example, the pop dogs. This again was all this study, so they could look at what's going on. And so then the assessment of endocrine control, they developed a what's called a novel algorithm. So let's say if the pre uh, the pre pill cortisol was very very low, like less than 1.5 micrograms per deciliter, and then that so called post pill cortisol, you can't read this, but it's less than 1.5. If it started out at one point less than 1.5, and, and after the pill it was less than 1.5, that would be over control. If, for example, the pre pill cortisol was greater than five, and the post pill was less than one to five or 1.5, that would be viewed as moderate control. So again, they had this algorithm where they uh, uh, tried, to, tried to sort out uh, that how the endocrine control was doing based on two cortisols. And so what they found is, is the first morning basal cortisol, the pre pill, correlated best with the degree of clinical control, uh, which was based on the owner's total history score and then it was better than the post-ACTH-stimulated cortisol when you're looking at correlation coefficients. So a lot of work needs to be done, but it's kind of neat that they're looking at this, and this may be what, uh, an alternative way to monitor these dogs. Um, they, I know in, in, in New England, we're charging, in the New England area, $250, $300 for an ACTH response test. So if you were doing two cortisols, and uh, you kept a dog for three hours, would you charge 250 or $300 for that? Probably not. Um, and probably have a, a lot better um, compliance for the owner coming back uh, to do the monitoring for the dog. So the cost of the ACTH preparation is, is very expensive. And, uh, and about a third of the dogs, as I told you, there's a um, poor relationship to clinical response in some dogs. So this is the the pre-post method is a little cheaper, and a closer relationship, at least in this pilot study, uh, to clinical signs. And overall, they were just shooting for cortisols between 1.5 and 5 micrograms per deciliter in that pre-post range. Okay, so here we have a PDH dog put on trilostan. This is how this dog initially looked. And it had a simulation test that went up to around 25. That's well above 20, which is the cutoff for most laboratories. So this is pre-trial stain. This is post-trial stain. Pretty amazing. This dog was on once a day therapy, 15 milligrams. Now, this owner was very upset that her dog looked like this. They were bald. It's got a funny haircut. She is even more upset when the hair color came back different. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you fix that? <laughs> <laughs> so here's Bo the boss dog. Oh, okay. uh, you realize with Bo, a lot of moans and groans. You don't even have to do screening tests on Bo. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you don't even need the MRI. You can just see what it's doing to his eyes and his tongue. Okay, that tumor out there. He had very advanced cushions. Here's his poor owner. Uh, Bo would uh, take the stainless steel water bowl and just kick it across the tile floor and you could hear his bang 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 okay because it was empty and then he would bark through the stereotype refrigerator barking oh, this is the result okay so he had bilaterally enlarged adrenals and he was started on 10 milligrams of veteril prior to staying once a day 
And uh, typically we get the dogs back in a couple weeks. Um, and uh, in two weeks he had, uh, this is in the time when we were kind of experimenting with resting cortisols. And uh, there were no improvement in clinical signs. We got them back at four weeks. By the way, a lot of dogs, they're not that much better at two weeks. So that is, that's not so surprising with this drug. And, but we got him back at four weeks. His cortisols look really good. They look, this is the, he's within the Ed Feldman range, or like 1.5 or 5 microns <coughs> PL. No improvement in clinical signs whatsoever. So here we have cortisols that look great, and a dog is doing terrible. What in the world's going on here? This is very, very typical in dogs that need a BID. This is telling us that most likely, even though we haven't proved it yet, that the duration of action of the trial is staying is too short. And so that's why it's not controlling the clinical signs. So we take what's called an action step. And what we typically do in this situation is we split the dose of trial stain. Whatever dose we're giving, we split it in half and we give it twice a day. It was brought back two weeks later and the stimulation test looked pretty good. But most importantly, complete resolution of clinical signs. We see this very, very commonly on dogs that are on SID therapy. Doesn't mean that they'll always be like this, but if you start a dog out on SID, cortisol look good, the dog is doing clinically very badly, then typically, assuming the diagnosis is correct, uh, then this is a dog that probably should be BID. Uh, here's Nina, uh, ACTH response test, um, all the way up to about 60, uh, very, very high. And uh, these, it's hard just for you to see here, but these are just bilaterally enlarged adrenals and Nina. Uh, and she was started on 30 milligrams SID once a day of trilostane. And the month, one month recheck, and that's long enough now, this dog should be better if that's the right dose. Still very PUPD. Uh, and the stimulation test was pretty reasonable. That's below the mark, that's within Mark Peterson's uh, uh, range, optimal range. And so that looks pretty good, but the dog is again doing very badly. Now this particular veterinarian that was uh, in charge of this case decided to leave Nina on the same dose. And now, and one month later, she still comes in again. Look at the difference now. Here she is, one month recheck. One month later, she goes, look at this, just in one month. That's how cushionoid she got. Now clearly she's not doing very well. And uh, I think most of us, you know, once we've learned how to use this drug, we would have, a month earlier, gone ahead and split the dose and given it a BID. Okay, so bottom line is, she's not doing well, she's on SID therapy, still PUPD, and she's developing this, this phenotype of Cushing's. So what do we do? Well, we took the total dose and divided it into two doses, so now we're giving her 15, Nina, 15 milligrams of BID with food. Here's the initial, so Nina initially. Now, now we're up at a month later after this. BID got her up. You can see the pop belly has gone away. And look at her, it's seven months out now. Look at that, it's unbelievable. It does, looks like a totally different dog. It is. Really the same dog. And again, it's very upset. Okay, because the coat is coming a different color. You got to warm up that. It's very common. The textures are different and the color sometimes is different. So, SID versus BID trial stain, and the winner is SID dosing, 80% efficacy. May only control one clinical symptom. It's kind of interesting. Some of the dogs are POPD go away, but they're still eating too much, vice versa. So, but it might be just good enough that that's fine with the owner. Uh, it's practical with SID dosing, lower costs, of course, better compliance in theory, and usually we'll start at that two mix per K. BID dosing, I've already gone over the efficacy issues. Typically, it controls all the clinical signs. You could argue it's less practical, maybe a little higher cost, possibly lower compliance. Give it with food, though, so it's, you know, it shouldn't. Once they get used to giving it, it should be a big problem. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's the difference between SID and BID dosing. Key points, uh, it's effective in most cases. There are definitely cases where it doesn't work very well. 
probably because they should get a TID, but as you know, no drug works going to work 100% of the time. And uh, twice daily dosing appears to be slightly more efficacious um, and maybe more costly. And the ACTH response test, even though it's not the greatest test in the world for making the diagnosis of Cushing's, is absolutely the gold standard for monitoring therapy. And by the way, the whole idea of mentioning that, that many dose of corticin was, you might want to employ that with your monitoring, um, uh, when monitoring these dogs, to save a little bit of money. Okay, so what are some other issues associated with Cushing's syndrome? I want to talk a little bit about adrenal tumors. Slowly progressive adrenal necrosis, show you a case of that, so you won't miss it. And some comorbidities are very common. Well, not all of them. Uh, hypertension, proteinuria, chronic kidney disease, I'm going to address that very quickly. UTIs, you know, half the dogs that have Cushing's, uh, you're going to culture bacteria from your urine. And only about 5% of them are clinical because of all that cortisone floating around. So it's very common for them to have UTI. And over half the dogs have significant proteinuria, if you're curious, they have a tumor Diabetes mellitus, about 5-10% of dogs um, will develop diabetes. And uh, uh, then we have SARS, that blindness issue. And then we have the uh, biliary mucus seals. Uh, dogs with Cushing's, or let's put it this way, if the dog develops a mucus seal, uh, there are 20 times greater chance that they're going to develop that mucus seal if they have underlying Cushing's disease. So if you ever see a dog with a, with a mucus seal, let's say you discover it accidentally because you're doing an ultrasound, and think to yourself, well, I wonder why that's there. I'm wondering <coughs> if they could have underlying Cushing's disease. doesn't mean they do. It just means that they're, they're at risk for it. Okay, so here's Charlie, a sheepdog, 11 year old, and he had an abdominal mass. End up being an unresectable metastatic adrenal carcinoma. Not a lot of things you're going to be able to do with this. However, you have a couple of choices. You can use trilostane or you can use lysogen. And the problem with lysogen is a lot of times it makes the dogs really, really sick. Just the drug itself, because you have to use very high dosages. Uh, with trilostane, we can get by with much smaller dosages, and the drug itself doesn't make them sick. And, uh, and they live is longer and longer, which is pretty amazing. So it's really a quality of life issue. Uh, poor Charlie, this is 13 months later. This is what, the way things looked, and these are the kind of clinical signs that he had. But the owner was very pleased because he had, at least for a year, had a very good quality of life. These carcinomas can be metastatic. They're just a real, real ugly tone. Um, and so, Phylostane uh, or Veteril, these dogs will show clinical improvement of their Cushing despite progressive metastasis. Most owners will describe a good quality of life. Eventually the dogs, the dogs will die from the cancer, and, but it's a, a safe and effective um, uh, palliative type medical control. And survival range is all the way up to 17 months. Uh, here is just one study that was done that was published in the Internal Medicine Journal. It's not a very big study, it's just showing thumbs up to the works and adrenal tumors. They looked at nearly 40 cases in a few centers in the UK over about 12 years. Interestingly, again, not a lot of uh, cases, but no statistical difference in survival time between mitotane and trilostane. But again, you could argue there's not a lot of cases here. And if they had metastatic disease, it's never a good thing. They're not going to do very well. And what we really don't know, though, is the dosing and the frequency of administration. Most of the time, we'll start off with a milligram per kilo and give a VIP, and then go up from there if you need. So, this is Earl. This is a classic case, Earl will be, of adrenal necrosis, slow, onset. Um, so here is Earl pre-treatment. Here's Earl on trial stay in four months and eight months. So. Here he is again, pre-treatment. I think you can see pretty well the changes are going on. By eight months now, it looks really pretty good. Now, we're going to take a look at the amount of trilostane he's been getting over time. These are months down here. So here is Earl in about between six and about eight months, right in here. And that's when you saw a picture of him at eight months, how good he looked. And then we're giving all this trilostane. All of a sudden, at about 24 months, we start seeing 
these quarter, the amount of the total daily dose of, of trotostane starting to come down. Why is that? Because the cortisols are coming down. But they're staying pretty steady for nearly two years. All of a sudden, they start falling off the cliff. So point number one is, it's very important to monitor these dogs so you can pick up that particular dog where those cortisols are going to start getting lower and lower and lower. Eventually, the drug, the cortisols got so low, the drug was stopped. And then we went ahead and did a simulation test a week later, and it was totally blown. This dog had totally necrosed its adrenals. Now, the adrenal necrosis is something we usually see many, many months after you started the drug. It's usually not due to your, the fact you're giving too much trilostain or you're overwhelming that synthetic pathway. Um, usually that happens very early when you just pick the wrong amount to start the drug on. And, uh, and we were able to stop the drug altogether. We never needed trilostain again. And we see this, I, I can't, we see it. It's not uncommon that we see that. Dogs that never need the drug again. I've got a number of dogs out there that they're, every time you look at their stimulated cortisol, it goes up to 1.5 or 2, stays that way. And, and, they, and there's, their animals are not on trial of staying, they stay that way for three or four years. Most of the time, though, what happens when you get those low cortisols, after a few weeks or months, they start creeping up again because that the adrenal cortex starts to grow. There's no way of predicting which dog will grow, which one will grow. So what the, the difference between veneral and trilostane, well, there's a lot of differences. One is, typically, for those of you, how many in here have used a lot of mitotane? Have used mitotane before? Okay, well, a number of you. Actually, quite a few of you, maybe a third. At least they raise your hand. Okay, if you'll remember with mitotane, typically, you've got to give more and more of this drug as time goes on to keep those cortisols controlled. And with trilostane, what we find is, I'd say with the vast majority of dogs, we end up getting less and less and less over time because of the adrenal process. So here's Charlie. Uh, he's a New Yorkie. You saw Charlie earlier. It was one of those three dogs that, act, well, I was asking if they had Cushing's or not. He was started on trilostane. He's a diabetic, and he has Cushing's. Uh, he started on three milligrams per kilo and three units of insulin, BID. Um, in four months, you look how he's getting better, he's happier. And now he's on six milligrams per kilo of trilostane. It's only on one unit of insulin BID, so he's still a diabetic, but he needs that much trilostane to control his cushion. Now, at six months, it's on 12 milligrams per kilo of trilostane. What you're seeing here is very, very common in some of these smaller dogs. They need tremendous amounts of this drug. And it's kind of scary when you're not, when you're not used to giving that much drug. Remember, we start these dogs on a milligram per kilo. And what if I said to you, well, why don't you start them on 12 milligrams per kilo? Well, oh, nobody would do that. Because you'd be afraid that you'd kill the cortisol. But nevertheless, this is what it took uh, to control the cortisol. So all I'm getting at is some of these smaller dogs just demand more. It's something about their enzymatic pathways are a little bit different. What's interesting is a lot of the bigger dogs, what in the world? <laughs> I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Okay. And a round of some applause. Okay. <laughs> so at any rate, a lot of the bigger dogs, you can, I'm exaggerating away, but you can have a hundred pound dog, you can just wave a ten milligram capsule in front of them, they start to fall over. <laughs> and look at this stuff. Jeez. Okay. So we're in mucus seals. Um, and we didn't see these very often be before the year 2000. And what, you know, maybe they were there, and, and maybe there's something new, I don't know. But certainly now in the age of ultrasound, we're seeing a lot more of them. Um, the prevalence of gallbladder and mucus is 20 times greater in dogs with Cushing syndrome than dogs without the disorder. This is from information out of, um, from Sharon Center and also out of the University of Pennsylvania and also in Europe. Uh, and other risk factors for mucus seals include hypothyroidism, diabetes, and dyslipidemia in general. Uh, I think you're all aware of how they look. And so again, if you have a dog that has a mucus seal, um, 
just step back and say, hey, you know, I wonder if this dog might have underlying Cushing's. So if it does, you're going to want to treat the Cushing's. Uh, and, um, and of course, in mucus if you're thinking about trying to handle it medically. Uh, what about proteinuria and Cushing's disease? We did a study years ago at the Animal Medical Center, a residence study, and because we, we noticed that a lot of dogs with Cushing's had proteinuria. And essentially, 50% of dogs with Cushing's disease will have proteinuria. Um, the vast majority of dogs that have Cushing's will have specific gravities less than 10, 20, or 25, well, 10, 25 and below. And 50% will have proteinuria, and about 50% will be hypertensive. Usually not tremendously hypertensive, but enough that it gets your attention. Um, and what's interesting about the dogs with their gomeroopathy, this is a normal gomeroopathy, and this is a gomeroopathy with a dog with Cushing's disease. Uh, they, um, it's very unusual for them to develop a nephrotic syndrome, where they drop their albumin and so forth, and get these lipids that are just through the roof. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a definite marker. A lot of times when I talk to veterinarians and and I'm not sure whether the dog has Cushing's or not, because it's, it's early, it's, the dog's not that clinical, I'll always ask about proteinuria and blood pressure and urine-specific gravity, just to get a better feel uh, for what's going on in that case. Okay, acute blindness and Cushing syndrome, is there a link? Uh, Cushing's like signs, and the signs nearly 40% of dogs have been reported with acute blindness, and most of the dogs have SARMs. Um, 140 dogs with acute blindness. This is a huge study that was done, published in vet ophthalmology. And of the 140 that had acute blindness, 120 were diagnosed with signs. And 33, a third of these dogs, had signs of Cushing's disease or Cushing's like signs. Ed Feldman, in his textbook, has a little section on this. And uh, he was asked to evaluate 44 dogs. This is in a third edition. Uh, that he evaluated dogs. Um, or there were 44 dogs evaluated for SARS, and 16 of the dogs, basically about a third, had one or more signs of Cushing's, and eight of the dogs um, had a positive screening test, or at least one screening test. So he's, it's really, this is his way of saying, well, yeah, there is some kind of a link. Um, this is a study out of South America. They had 70 dogs with confirmed PDH was sent into their clinic. 12 of the dogs presented out of the 70 for acute blindness. It's a pretty big percentage, between 15 and 20 percent. Uh, 10 of the 12 had SARS, and 2 of 12 had optic chiasm compression from a large macro tumor that was impending on that nerve. Uh, what was kind of interesting, I'm not sure we can really use it clinically, but they always reported rapid progression of the Cushing's like signs followed by blindness in these SARS dogs usually over three to 20 days, and it seemed like the Cushing just came on like gangbusters. Um, and as far as what's causing it, just disregard this sense. We don't really know. Um, if you take, what the ophthalmologists do is they take a look at these blind dogs and do an ERG. And if you have SARS, this is your ERG, that's not good. You don't want your ERG to look like that. And, uh, and the dogs that had optic eyes and neoplasia, the ERGs are actually normal. Um, and so that's, so a dog with SARS would be expected not to have one like this, but like that. So Cushing disease and SARS take home points. The cause of SARS is unclear. However, there does appear to be association with Cushing's. Uh, dogs with SARS, remember, a lot of times if you get one, a dog that's blind, you send it to an ophthalmologist, and then they usually send it back to you and say, <coughs> look it up for Cushing disease. The thing to remember is if you can work up for Cushing disease, but if you treat it for it, it's not, the blindness is not going to go away. Um, but the owner has got to think it will. And so you have to, um, to have that conversation. Um, and whether the treatment of Cushing disease will prevent or delay the onset of SARS is really pretty unclear. Because again, we don't really know what's going on here. What's very interesting, we have some dogs that develop blindness. And they truly have SARS. And it's documented in the ERG. And all of a sudden, they start, they develop PUPD and polyphagia. And uh, but these are dogs that have SARS, that you work them up for Cushing's, and they don't have Cushing's disease, but they act like it. 
And then all of a sudden, two or three months later, guess what happens? The PUPD and the polyphagia goes away. So it's, we think it's a behavioral issue that happens when these, these poor animals go blind. You know, this is how they act out. So, so you can have these dogs that act like they have it, but when you work them up, you can't convince yourself that what's going on is really a behavioral problem. So trilistain versus mitotain, and the winner is. Well, we're going to look at success rate, survival time, safety, and cost. That's what everybody does when they're trying to figure out is one drug better than the other. Uh, efficacy is similar. Uh, better all appears to have less side effects, meaning trilistain. Uh, the downside is it has to be, uh, better all has to be given every day, sometimes twice a day, uh, versus two or three times a week, mitotain. Uh, better all, maybe is it more expensive? It's coming down in price. And, uh, but nevertheless, we can make an argument that it might be, especially for a bigger dog. Survival times are similar, though, which is very interesting. And, uh, and in some of these studies, that uh, the better all dogs did better. And overall, trilistain is a more gentle way of achieving success. Uh, but it's still a personal choice. So if people ask me, I say, listen, it's a personal choice, whatever you want to do. Um, so which drug is better? Well, this is the sum of my efforts. I'm sure you've all been out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you might imagine, for those of you that haven't, you might imagine that that, that climb is a little rocky. It's cold. Somewhat dangerous. But when you got up there, it's a great view. And that's how it's how treatment of Cushing's with mitotain is described. Now, this is Mount Ben Nevis. This is over in Scotland, only 4,000 feet high. And it's switchbacks. So even I, I'm way out of Satan. I can get up there and come down all one day. And I won't die trying. <laughs> and you know, you get up there, and my grant's a little foggy, at least on this day. But so you would, so the, the climb's going to be a little easier. But when you get up to the top, uh, it's not so bad either, right? Yeah. And that's how treatment is described with. Or so this is the first dog, uh, not the first dog, uh, Carlos Melian, he's a famous veterinarian from, uh, from Spain, and uh, uh, this is really his case, and this is a poster child for Trilostain, that's on these Decker Pharmaceutical brochures, and so if you, if you remember seeing this dog, that's where you saw it, and so here, um, oh, this is bola, that means ball, and, and uh, Spanish, and uh, that's what was this name? So that's the initial picture. This is several months into trial stain therapy, and this is the final chapter. So it works really pretty well, and the coat didn't change colors maybe. <laughs> so what's around the corner? Very quickly, we're about to finish up here. Um, I already mentioned that with um, in veterinary medicine. We only have one person, at least right now, that can do a hypothesectomy. So that's over Washington State. And she does a very good job. But she's way up at Washington State, many clients aren't going to drive up there and do this sort of thing. And, uh, and then um, with uh, stereotactic therapy, it's quite expensive. Uh, and so these other forms of therapy, uh, a lot of people aren't going to choose it. And so what people are looking for is a designer drug that can be given orally that's going to cause the pituitary gland to undergo apoptosis, which is this slow program death. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, we've already discovered one drug, and that's a vitamin uh, A derivative. It's cis-nimetanoic acid um, that will do that over, on a daily basis, you give it, and the pituitary will get smaller and smaller, and the Cushing's will go into remission. Unfortunately, for a 10 kilo dog, it costs about $100,000 for this drug. <laughs> and so it's, it's out of most people's price, price range right now. So we're looking for other designer drugs, and this is cobertoline, and this is a dopamine receptor agonist. And these receptors are expressed uh, on ACTH producing cells of the pituitary. Those are the so called corticotropes. And 60% uh, and of those cells are functional. So the treatment with cobertoline is associated with decrease in endogenous ACTase levels, a decrease in the urine cortisol creatinine ratio, and a reduction in tumor size in over 40% of dogs with PDH. 
and the clinical signs would be expected to normalize by three months if indeed it was working after starting therapy and as early as one month. And it's given that this is a standard dose divided into three doses per week. Uh, Cabergoline, I don't know if you know anybody that takes this, people take it for um, prolactin producing tumors from, caused by the pituitary. And they'll get really nauseous on this drug, and dogs do too, but it, well, we can use the wonder drug to prevent that. Serenia, okay, first time around. And uh, usually they'll throw up at one time, and then they're fine after that. Uh, but, I'll, but if you wanted to, you could use pre with serenia. Um, so here's a survival curve, and looking at pituitary size before and after treatment. Before and after, before and after. It's pretty amazing. And uh, this is a study done in Spain, and, and the, uh, the control dogs, they that had cushions, they used ketoconazole, it's the drug that they're allowed to use there, they're not allowed to use trilostan or lysogen. And, uh, and there's the 50% uh, survival is around two years. And if you take a look at Cabergoline, it's way out here at three years, 50% survival. So these dogs lived a lot longer on Cabergoline. Uh, by the way, it's a 50% survival time at two years is about typically what we expect with lysogen and, and once daily trilostane. It's about two years. Uh, with twice daily trilostane, there's some studies that have shown that average survival time is a minimum of two and a half years, if not longer. Okay, now the problem is there is a relationship to tumor size and location. And tumors, theoretically, you would have to start out with a CT or an MRI. And if that tumor in the pituitary is less than five milligrams, not milligrams, millimeters, um, uh, these dogs are nine out of 11 dogs responded. If they're greater than five and a half millimeters, very few dogs responded. So the size of the tumor uh, is going to make is going to, is going to make that decision whether that dog's going to respond or not. And um, they now if you couldn't afford to get an MRI or a CT, what you could do is just start the drug. And if, and if they didn't get better in like three months, then you would just assume that that pituitary tumor was too large to make that decision. Okay, so try to stay. It's moving target as far as dosing, but we're coming to keep coming down with the dose. Um, and, uh, and remember limbo? Yeah. The lower you go. Okay, so what's happened over time is we've gone lower and lower with the dose. Uh, with diabetics, most of the time we're using VID insulin. And, and we're supposed to use VID trilostain, that's to remind you of that. And thumbs up is trilostain is very effective with adrenal tumors. I'm sure you're wondering what this is about. <laughs> <laughs> this is a reminder to keep an eye out for adrenal crisis. And how are you going to diagnose that? You're going to have to either establish that cortisols are dropping like that. And if the dog feels good, just stop the trial of stain. Come back five, seven days later, do a stimulation test. And you got a bummer response, guess what? It's a general process until proven otherwise. If that dog stimulates to a really high level, then you're not dealing with it. But if, you know, but if you're out a long time, I mean that dog has been on trial stain a long time, and you've had this precipitous drop over months to years. Uh, then when you get down to below two, I can guarantee you, you've got a panel of process and open the lines. So let me just tell you a real, and then we're going to wrap it up. This is a New York story. This is <coughs> grumpy cats. And, um, and the clients brought Scruffy into the Animal Medical Center. And to see myself and Mark Peterson. And they said, you know, we're having a real problem. And we looked at the dog and said, yeah, it does look that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very pathetic looking animal. He said, no, 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 that's not the problem. And then they said, well, you know, if you're not doing anything this afternoon at the Animal Ethical Center, why don't you come over to our apartment and we'll show you the problem. And so we were, it, for some reason, it wasn't that busy, so we went over. And they lived in a walk-up, a four-story walk-up. That means there was no, there was no um, elevator. And uh, sort of trudged all the way up these four stories. And we went up to their uh, apartment door and knocked on the door. 
And when they opened the door, this ammonia order just hit us in the face. It was just mm -hmm. terrible. And it smelled like urine. And they had wobble wall carpeting, and so we were invited in. And we, and we and with every step, he just sort of squished. <laughs> <laughs> and then we said, well, you know, we can understand what your problem is. He said, no, you don't understand. We're used to this. So well, what is your problem? Well, a lot of these older apartments in, in, uh, in New York City, uh, they still have plaster walls, plaster ceilings, and then underneath the carpeting is, you know, plaster floor. And uh, so what was happening is, is that urine was going through the carpet, seeping into the plaster, and then the people below them, as they're eating their fine dinner, their, all their fine culinary, all of a sudden, this urine-soaked plaster was falling on their heads. Oh. And they complained to the superintendent. Yeah. And they were about to get evicted. And so that's the only reason why they brought their dog in. Oh. So their dog was so PUPD, they wanted us to fix it. And evidently, what they would do is, they would fill up this giant bucket full of water. And, was, and because they were too lazy to go up and down the stairs, they couldn't walk their dog enough. Because there's no elevator. And they just let their dog drink all day and then get, you know, urinate and all that. And they just got kind of used to it. Until the complaints came in. Mm. Okay, so here's Scruffy. So, remember in, as, in the old days, we only had one drug. And that was Lysol. That was our silver bar. Mm. It's the same dog. And so we, they didn't get a bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hopefully we've come from a place of confusion to clarity. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Are there any questions? This is really not to walk. Okay, I can tell you this can't wait to start drinking our leave. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see the question. Oh, yeah. Um, I can't really comment. They are using cobertoline and equine, but I, I don't know exactly what they're doing with equine. I'm strict. I, you know, I, I know a little bit, but not very much. Let's put it that way. You heard whispers. Okay. <laughs> This is another question I can't answer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. In the storage of the partition. Uh, so if you, if it's refrigerated, it's good for four months. If you freeze it, you just have to use it when you thaw it out. Is that how it works? That's correct. We, um, the studies that have been done when it's frozen, assuming it's in a freezer, it doesn't have a freeze thaw cycle. They, we know it's good for six months, probably longer. But it's, it's like anything else. The studies were only done in six months. So if people are being honest with you, they'll say, you know, it's good for at least six months. It's probably, it's probably longer um, uh, if you're freezing it. And if you are going to freeze it, I think, you know, if you look at Mark Peterson's blog, you will talk about putting in the plastic syringes and, and you freeze out the clots. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's 30 micrograms, 50 micrograms, really up to you. And uh, that's what you want to do, I think. Um, the reality is, you know, if, if you're giving one microgram per kilo or greater, you're you're giving you're giving plenty of cordyceps to these dogs. But if you are using it anything close to one microgram, you really want to try to be extra conscious about or just be very conscious about the timing and make sure that you pull that second sample in one hour. Try not to be late. So have they seen the, the effects of freezing? Does, do they find that it breaks it down? Do they refreeze it? Or do they did they study that? Nobody studied that. Okay. That's a great question. But nobody's, nobody's looked at that. We're afraid that might happen, though, but we don't know. Because that's what we're worried about with these freeze thaw. Uh, most freezers, you know, they have a thaw cycle. And uh, and, we're, and so what we don't know, if they go through that, but the efficacy be disturbed. It's just nobody's this, you know, it'd be, if somebody's really bored, somebody's going to do that study someday, but nobody's done it. Yeah.